Uh, today we're going to talk about cause and effect. Cause and effect is a fundamental teaching in the Buddhist path. The, uh, uh, the Buddha actually is considered to have accomplished two supreme accumulations, two supreme accumulations, and especially uh, from the Vajrayana point of view, which we practice here, the, the uh, method of Vajrayana, these two accumulations are considered to be supreme. They are, they are the condensation of the, uh, the condensed form or the pith form of the eightfold, eightfold path that the Buddha taught. They are all of the Buddha's wisdom and awareness and, and vision brought into these two concepts, in a sense. What are these two accumulations? Uh, the two accumulations are one, the accumulation of wisdom and the accumulation of knowledge, number two. The accumulation of wisdom is not the way we think. Uh, when we as ordinary people consider the word wisdom, we think of the word wisdom as being the accumulation of wiseness, which is a thing. And wiseness or wisdom is something that you actually have to dress up to do. Perhaps you have to wear white robes and perhaps you have to look a certain way and uh, adapt a wise demeanor and that um, as one moves through certain experiences we think that one uh, becomes more and more wise as though wisdom were something that were growing um, a person uh, that is very old perhaps and has seen a lot and has had a lot of experience uh, we are fond of saying is very wise from the Buddhist point of view that may not be true at all in fact the opposite may be true uh, someone who has seen a lot of things and done a lot of things may actually be quite cluttered in their minds with a lot of um, conceptualization and a lot of uh, conceptual discrimination. The Buddhist usage of the word wisdom is quite different from that. In fact, it is the opposite in a sense. According to the Buddhist view, particularly in this, this method of Vajrayana, Wisdom is considered the awakening to the primordial wisdom nature that is emptiness. So that if one had attained wisdom, one would actually be free of conceptualization, free of specific awareness. One, one's mind would rest in the spontaneous display of luminosity and be simply awake innately wakeful, aware but in a non-specific way, simply awake. The condition of the mind would be very spacious, like uncontrived luminosity, simply awake. In that awareness of wisdom there is no clinging to concept, there is no division through the mind focusing on distinctions such as the distinction between self and other. There is no focusing on a concept such as self. One is simply awake. So wisdom then is the awareness of emptiness. Wisdom is the accomplishment of, the, of that view that is the awakening to the primordial wisdom nature. It is liberation. And so that is one accumulation that the Buddha has actually accomplished. He's accumulated through his meditation, through his practice, that precious awakened state in which one understands and one views, one tastes the uncontrived nature of emptiness. The second accumulation is the accumulation of knowledge. Again, as ordinary sentient beings, as Westerners, as adults, we think of knowledge in a different way. We might think of knowledge as being what one accumulates when one goes to university, when one goes to school. And we might think that the most knowledgeable person is the person with the most degrees. Um, I actually have never been guilty of thinking that. But anyway, um, one might think that if one reads all the books, then one would have accumulated a great deal of knowledge. One, one might think that if one 
uh, is, is very intelligent and able to compute large amounts of numbers for no apparent reason, then uh, one would be able to, one would have a great deal of intelligence. Um, but in fact, if you think about it, haven't you seen people who can do things like that, who have gone to school and have many degrees and perhaps can, can compute amazing mathematical feats and, uh, and yet don't seem to have a great deal of knowledge about how things happen, don't seem to have a lot of just common ordinary horse sense, uh, don't seem to be able to move through experience in any controlled or competent way. Uh, so there's different kinds of, of intelligence that's true. And we as ordinary people might have certain ideas as to what the accumulation of knowledge might be. You know, anything from reading some book of knowledge to, and memorizing it to, to having uh, the ability to, to master certain facts. Actually, uh, the Buddhist idea of the accumulation of knowledge is quite different. The Buddhist idea of the accumulation of knowledge and that which the Buddha has accomplished is the accumulation of the knowledge of cause and result. Cause and result. In that, in order to attain the goal that if we think about it, all sentient beings really wish to have, we must have the knowledge of cause and result. That is the one bit of knowledge that without which we are completely useless. We have no competency, we have no method, we have no ability, we have no hope. Without the knowledge of cause and effect, we have nothing really. And that is what the Buddha has actually accomplished, is the, the knowledge of cause and effect. It is possible to know how to add great columns of numbers, to know how to perform a calculus, to know how to delve into mathematical theory. It is possible to know um, how to get there from here. It is possible to read the book of knowledge. It is possible to have so many degrees that you could paper your wall with them. It is possible to know many things about many things, and therefore you know many things and still not be happy. Isn't that true? It is absolutely possible to know every wine on the wine list and still not be happy. It is possible to know which fork to use and not be happy. It is possible to walk into a restaurant and not be confused by the fact that you're having both hors d'oeuvre and salad. <laughs> and still not be happy. It is possible to know exactly how to dress in any given social situation, including when not to wear pearls, and still not be happy. It is possible how to know to use, to know how to use the metro here in the Washington area, a mystery to me, even till this day, and still not be happy. All these things are possible and one could not be happy. But the one thing that one must have in order to learn how to be happy is the understanding of cause and result. And there are many, many intelligent and highly educated people who have no understanding of cause and result at all. And even people who think that they have the understanding of cause and result might not have any understanding of cause and result. And how are you going to test yourself and see if you really understand cause and result? What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to look at the content of your life and see, first of all, are you always happy? And since, of course, as a sentient being, you're not always happy. No one is. We all have mood changes. We all have uh, situations that affect us in ways that are difficult. You have to ask yourself if you know how to change your life permanently and without difficulty. You have to ask yourself if you know how to make others happy. You have to ask yourself if you know how to conquer loneliness permanently and without difficulty. If you know how to conquer poverty. Do you know how to conquer sickness? Do you know how to conquer everything that troubles you? 
And of course, no ordinary sentient being can think like that. None of us really have all those answers. We seem to be gaining in experience from time to time. And every now and then we'll do something successfully and we'll think, well, I've really handled that, you know, I'm coming along. I've certainly had that feeling, hadn't you? Haven't you had that feeling that you've moved through an experience successfully and feel as though you've gained by it? That you've, that you've, that you've helped yourself and progressed? But still none of us have the accumulation of, of knowledge. None of us really understand totally cause and result. And one of the reasons why none of us can totally understand cause and result is because we don't really understand what we are. We think of ourselves as a creature that was born from our mothers so many years ago however long that was, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago, whatever. We think of ourselves as this individual with this name, not understanding what we actually are. And of course we've heard teaching, and we've heard the idea that perhaps we've lived before. Maybe we believe that, maybe we don't know for sure, maybe we're not certain, but we think that maybe we might have been born before, but we don't really remember. Even if we think we have a ghost of a memory, we don't actually understand that we've been born before. It isn't really meaningful to us in our ongoing process every moment of every day that we spend. And the thing that we've lost sight of, since we don't really remember all our previous lives, if any, and don't think that you do, no matter how smart you are, because you don't remember all your previous lives. The Buddha teaches us that we have existed since, existed since time out of mind. Inconceivable time that we have had past experience. So it isn't possible to remember all your past experiences. No one can unless one has attained the mind of enlightenment totally and one fully understands cause and result. So if, if we cannot remember all of our past experiences, that means that we cannot remember the causes that have brought the results that we experience right now. We might have a clue, and the clue that the Buddha tells us to really take to heart is that the best way to know what your past is like is to look in the mirror. The best way to know what your past is like is to look in the mirror. It's that simple. It pays, it pays nothing. It makes no sense at all to go to a psychic reader and have a psychic reader tell you who you were in the past. You can chalk that up to blah, 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 yada, yada. And it also makes no real sense to meditate on what your past lives might have been because that's also blah, 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 yada, yada. The best way to find out what you were in the past is to look at yourself now. Do you have the habit of pride? you have the habit of making yourself out to be something? Do you have the habit of generosity? Are you normally kind? Do you really, or is generosity just an idea but you don't actually get around to doing it? You know what I mean? Do you practice, do you, do you practice meditation easily? Is that easy for you? Or is it difficult for you to get into the habit? Do you get angry easily? Are you reactive? Do you react very easily? Do you find yourself habitually in certain kinds of situations? Are you beautiful to look at? Are you healthy? Are you well off? Are your relationships harmonious? Are you feeling good? Is it, are you, do you generally feel good? Or do you generally feel kind of in difficult, you know, kind of challenged, like you're having a tough time. Looking at yourself in that way and what you habitually seem like, and what you actually do, and what you actually feel like, and what you actually look like, and how others see you, will tell you much more about your past lives than any psychic can, or that you ever could, even if the information was channeled to you from the Pleiades or the great beyond somewhere. To look in the mirror is the best way to know what causes you have invoked through your previous activities. 
And it's also the best way to know how to change. There are certain habits that we have in our minds. Some people are habitually rigid. They have a hard time accepting new ideas. Some people hear even words that are pretty agreeable, like you can change through practicing generosity. And their habit is to sit there and go, hmm. well, I don't know about that. It's not that easy. She's being awfully simplistic here. Or they might uh, think, oh, yes, yes, I'm moved to my core. And I'm always moved to my core, no matter what anybody says to me. So whatever the habit of your mind happens to be, whatever the state of your mind happens to be, all of that, even that kind of thing, is due to what you have done in the past. And you have within you a constant stream, a continuum, that actually consists of habitual tendency brought forward through causes that you have engaged in previously. Cause and result, that's what we're experiencing right now. So difficult for us to understand because we think that we are experiencing ourselves and our unique and mind-blowingly important individuality. Don't you have a unique and mind-blowingly important individuality? Isn't that what you think every day of your life? Me too. But in fact, according to the Buddha, this unique and mind-blowing individuality is nothing other than a continuum that actually consists of a stream of habits brought about by certain causes that we have invoked in our past. That this unique and mind-blowing, spectacularly, ironically, fantastic and different individuality that you are experiencing it's not your nature at all. It's not even what you are. This creative, unique thing that you call you, that you cultivated and preened all this time to be even more you. That you delight in every time you find yet another habit, another characteristic that you can call your very own. According to the Buddha's teaching, that's not even it. That's nothing. That's like blowing your nose. That's not any kind of truth at all. According to the Buddha's teaching, that's not you. Your nature is the Buddha nature. Your nature is this undefiled primordial wisdom state, this uncontrived sheer luminosity, the very display of your nature, which is so holy is compassion itself. That is your nature. And the heartbreaking thing about it is that it's all the same in everybody. So all that preening you did to be an individual is kind of stupid if you think about it. When everybody's nature is the same. Actually, you're even the same as a horse, or a cow, or a turtle, or a pig, because each of us, all sentient beings, in their nature are the Buddha nature. And someday each of us will awaken to that primordial wisdom nature. That's hard to take, isn't it? Isn't that hard to take? Same as a heart as a horse and a cow. Moo. That's pretty heartbreaking, but according to the Buddha, we all have the same nature. And according to the Buddha, that cow or that horse is moving through the experience of samsara just like you, born to be a cow or a horse, according to their habitual tendency. If they were born to be a cow, it's probably because they've practiced a lot of dullness. And that dullness appears with that display. But in their nature, they are the Buddha nature also. And even that cow will someday come to the auspicious junction, will meet with the method in some way and eventually attain realization and become the Buddha. So that cow is just as important as you. What an insult when you've been cultivating individuality all your life. I mean, just think about it. Geez, that's really hard to take. 
You think about cockroaches and worms and all those things. We're falling apart here, aren't we? <laughs> the Buddha teaches us that all sentient beings are equal. So the most amazing thing about it is that you thought that you were this really limited ego structure, you know, that you had this neuroses, that you, that you, that you had this habit, that you, that you, whatever it was that you could name about yourself, and you thought that's what it was. If you think about it, that's a very limited structure, isn't it? If you can name it, it's finite. If you can name it, it's limited. If you can predict how you're going to feel and what you're going to do, that's a small piece of change. The good news is that the Buddha teaches us that that is not our nature, that that our nature is this gorgeous display, this uncontrived primordial view that is without limitation, without distinction, innately wakeful, sheer luminous display. But that's our true nature. So it's actually much bigger than we thought and much better than we ever thought. What we are experiencing now are our own habitual tendencies to be caught up in and to think in a certain way. We can't see our nature. We can't see the nature of those around us, so we practice prejudice. We practice anger. We practice hatred. We practice neuroses. We can't see that what we are being prejudiced against or what we hate or what we are not being generous toward is our own face. We can't look at another, can't look at another person, can't look at a cow, can't look at anything else in samsara and see that it is our own face. And so we cannot see our own face. What we do see is our own habit patterns, cause and effect relationships, a continuum, a tunnel, if you will, of cause and effect relationships, a tapestry that we've brought forward into this life and that has developed even further throughout this life until we practice the view and begin to untangle some of that and allow the mind to rest joyfully and spontaneously in spaciousness to rest spontaneously in the natural state. If we understand cause and effect, we can begin to make that change. We can begin to awaken to our true nature and to see our true nature. And it's not a letdown to find out that this nature is also within a cow. It's not a letdown to find out that this nature is all pervasive. To be able to open one's eyes in the sense of attaining pure view in the way that one attains view when one is, transfers the consciousness from ignorance to bliss as in being born in Daywatchen, the symbol of, being, of transferring the consciousness from ignorance to bliss. When one accomplishes that, one becomes awake. The eyes which were confined to hard distinction, which were compromised by tightness and restriction and ignorance, the ignorance born of the idea of duality, the ignorance born of the idea of believing in self-nature as being inherently real and needing to distinguish self from other, that false assumption. are not, no longer limited by that false assumption, but instead, instead the mind awakens to the pure view of nature, of the nature. And in that nature there is only bliss because there is no cause for suffering. And now we're back to cause and effect. What are the causes of suffering? The Buddha teaches us that the causes of suffering are hatred, greed and ignorance, the three root poisons, and that all poisons, all sufferings come from that. Hatred, greed, and ignorance. And the mother of all of that, desire, 
actually the, the desire to perpetuate the idea of self and the mind of duality and distinction. Hatred, greed and ignorance, the three root poisons, the mother of all suffering. And from that jealousy, from that competitiveness, from that pride, from that anger, from that grief, from that hunger, from that poverty, all of these ills that fill the world and seem to fill our lives are actually part of this cause and result continuum that we are involved in. The basis of this continuum, of course, being desire, being hatred, greed, and ignorance. We think that we understand that. Even We hear that idea now. Now you have that idea, and perhaps you'll carry that idea home and really think about it. But the understanding for that takes a great long time, and it must cut to the bone. It must go very deeply. Because we will still perpetuate our own suffering. If I say to you that hatred is one of the three root poisons, that hatred is synonymous with anger in a sense, you might theoretically understand me. You understand me, don't you? You hear that. You know, you know what I'm talking about. And yet, you might go to your home, and in your home, you might say something like, you might, someone might say something to you, like, um, perhaps a, you're a woman, let's say, here's a theoretical idea. As a woman, you might go home, and your husband might say to you, hey, fry me up some chicken, will you? <laughs> uh, I feel like some chicken tonight. Can I have some chicken? And you're tired, and you don't want to fry up chicken, to tell you the truth. You're not even in the mood to eat chicken. You're so tired, you don't want to think about chicken. But your husband says, hey, fry me up some chicken. So you have to fry up some chicken. And you're just, you think that it's wrong for him to say that to you. You, you think that it's not right for someone to just throw off a demand to you. Why didn't he fry up his own chicken? Why does he have to eat chicken anyway? Why doesn't he eat peanut butter sandwich? What's wrong with going out to visit the colonel? You know, what's the problem here? I'm so tired. Why is he so insensitive? Why does he have to put off that stuff on me all the time? What is this? And you allow yourself to delight in that kind of situation. And there's a delight about it, isn't there? I'm right. He's wrong. He's doggone insensitive, isn't he? Tell me to fry up some chicken, and 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 I'm sort of noble, don't you think, to go ahead and do it? All right, I'll work my fingers to the bone. Okay, all right. I know I'm tired, but I'll be a good wife because I'm spiritual. But I'll hate you, dog on it. And I'll fry up the chicken, and I'm going to fry up the chicken now. So you think you understand that hatred is one of the three root poisons? But what have you just done? You've just delighted in it. You took a bath in it. You ate it. Mm, mm. And it made me feel so good because I got to cling to the idea that I'm spiritual and that I can fry chicken and he can't. And, you know, he's wrong and I'm right. And, you know, it gave me all these wonderful ideas about myself. Mm, wasn't that delicious? The experience of the continuum of self-nature. Don't you love it? Just so good. So good. So delicious. So exotic. So tasty. When, if you had really taken the, um, the teaching to heart, you might not have practiced such idiot compassion as frying up the chicken. You might have actually said, no. <laughs> I hear that you want the chicken, and I hope that you find it, but no. and then let it go. And there's so many good things that could have come from that. Like, first of all, maybe he wouldn't have eaten the chicken, and I understand fried chicken is not that great for you anyway. Second of all, he might have learned to fend for himself. He might have grown up a little bit, and he might not demand something of that, like that next time. He might think about it. Lots of good things could have come from that.
Lots of good things could have come from that. But not hatred, necessarily. It's a silly example, isn't it? But it's a good one. And it shows us how we don't really understand cause and, cause and result. Another good example of that would be uh, one day we decide that we're lonely. That in our lives we really have no one with whom we can totally communicate. If any of you have ever had that feeling, you know how delicious that feeling can be. You get into that feeling. I'm such a deep person and I have no one with whom I can really communicate. No one understands the depth of my depth. And, and I'm, I'm so amazing, really. There are very few people that understand me. And uh, I know people, I know lots of people, but none of them can go to the level to which I can go. None of them understands my sorrow. Do you know that I sorrow greatly? I sorrow greatly because I'm a sensitive person. And I've always been that way. That's why I wear a lot of dark colors. <laughs> I'm black and everything. And, and nobody understands the depth. Nobody knows the suffering I feel. Anyway, <laughs> nobody knows my sorrow. So we kind of sing songs like that, and we get sort of involved with that. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very unique, and it's, it's very interesting. And we sort of make a god out of that, kind of a religion out of that, don't we? That uh, we're special, and we continue our loneliness, and we let our loneliness really happen to us. And we... And I'm a rebel. Another thing, too. Don't forget this. I'm a rebel. I'm different. I'm really different. I'm artistic, and I'm rebellious, and I'm not going to heal, and nobody understands me because I'm great. I'm really so great. Watch me be great. Want to see me be great? So anyway, we delight in our loneliness. We take... Mm, yum, 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 yum. So delicious. And our loneliness becomes our best companion. We're actually delighted and we're not lonely at all. We have our little bedside companion to keep us warm. Well, maybe not in bed, but you know what I'm saying. Still stays lonely in bed, doesn't it? <laughs> But we have our bedside companion here, and, and, and our loneliness is our best friend. And actually, we don't understand cause and result, because what, what are we doing when we engage in that kind of activity? Are we satisfying ourselves? Are we being happy? What we're actually doing is we're engaging in causes such as pride. What is the result of pride? What can the result of pride be? The result of pride has got to be suffering. It has to be. It has to be. How can you really feel intimate with and close to another human being with pride? How can you engage in the building blocks for a satisfying life, a satisfying human relationship with pride? We're also engaging in clinging to self-nature fixating in this myopic way on self-nature. Is that going to end loneliness? Is that going to make the world a better place? Is that going to make your life deeper and more satisfying? Think! What are you doing? You're creating the causes for more suffering. Do you think that doing that and fixing your whole life on this crazy idea of how wonderful you are in your loneliness, that in some future life you're going to be born into a good family that really loves you and you're going to have kind relationships and the world is going to be generally supportive of you in every way, why should it? You haven't been supportive of the world. You haven't created the causes by which that happiness would naturally occur. So you don't understand cause and effect relationships. You really don't. In theory, yes. But we constantly, and this is one of the Buddha's teachings, we constantly engage in activity that brings about a mixed bag of, of tricks. Some happiness and some suffering, because we do not understand cause and effect. And for most of us, we constantly engage, for all of us really, we constantly engage in behavior that brings about future suffering. We don't fully understand cause and result. According to the Buddha's teaching, everything, every bit of knowledge that you should have should be about cause and result. 
And you have to learn something about the activity in your own mind. We think that it's advantageous and wonderful and exotic and beautiful and special to engage in activity that we cling to in our mind and that activity might very well be a certain kind of righteous anger or a certain kind of ego clinging or a certain kind of even ignorance. Some of us feel justified and righteous in our ignorance. We want to remain as we are, not change, rigid and frigid in our minds. So many weird ideas and the, the weird ideas that we have are really only based in not fully understanding cause and result. Cause and result can be so easy, but we have to really study on it. We have to really study on it, apply our minds and really focus in. Time to focus in, children. This is where you really have to think. You really have to think like this. Kindness produces happiness, period. If you are kind for 10 minutes and you do not automatically produce a happy life out of that 10 minutes of kindness, the only reason for that is that you have been unkind for more than 10 minutes and that's probably what's ripening at the moment. So don't, and this has happened to me where students will be kind for 10 minutes or a week maybe, you know. You ever tried to be kind for a week? You can't be kind for a week. You don't have the habit of it yet. But anyway, they swear to me they have been kind for a whole week and they can't figure out why they're still depressed. They're not happy yet. Well, the reason why is that you've been engaging in mixed behavior or ignorant behavior or perhaps creating the causes for unhappiness since time out of mind. A week is relatively short time, you see. You have to be at it a little bit longer. You have to develop the habit of practicing the method so that the method becomes normal for you, natural for you. And that's only through creating the habit. You create the habit of kindness. Ha kindness becomes part of you in the same way that suffering or depression or being a unique individual used to be your habit. Now you cultivate a new habit. Create the causes by which future happiness will result. Over time, the scales will balance and you will experience happiness, but it takes time. And just as you've worked very hard at being the unique suffering individual that you are today, it's going to take time to create the opposite habit, to antidote the habit, but it really boils down to very simple things like cause and result. If you're sick of poverty, practice generosity. If you don't have the proverbial pot or window, then think of different ways that you can be generous. Generous with your time, generous with your love. You know, if you have four shirts to your name, give one of them away. You'll live with three shirts. It'll be better for you. It's so crazy it could work, you know? Be generous with your attitude. Be generous with your kindness. Be generous with your life. There are lots of ways that you can practice that. And in the future, you will reap the benefit of prosperity and happiness. Immediately, the act of, of generosity brings happiness. If you really let your mind rest in that, Treat yourself to the taste of it. But it's very simple cause and result. If you end, if you refuse to practice hatred and practice instead loving kindness, and even if you have to start real small, moment by moment, and it's really hard for you. It's going to be really hard at first. You're going to say, okay, I'm practicing kindness now. It really starts off like that at first. It's very hard sometimes. But little by little, you develop the habit and pretty soon it's natural for you. It's just natural for you. In time, happiness will pervade your life, will overtake your life. It's that easy. It's about cause and result. There's no mystery to it. What I love is the spiritual idea that people have that they'll go to a great master, preferably one that's dressed up to look like a great master because that adds to the 
ambiance of the spiritual search. So anyway, go to a great master someplace in the Himalayas if you can possibly arrange it because that also adds to the ambiance of the search. So anyway, you go to the great master and you say to the great master, oh great master, in the proper physical posture, if at all possible, or whatever, salami, salami, bologna, whatever it happens to be. <laughs> oh great master, yeah that one, how about that one? Oh great master, tell me what is the secret of life? That's this idea that we have about spiritual, you know, spiritual truth. And it, that's a crazy idea, really, and it prevents you, it makes you impotent spiritually. It prevents you from actually understanding anything very much. According to the Buddhist teaching, it's very simple. It's about cause and result. The mystery of life is that life occurs due to causes you have yourself, with very little help, invoked in the past. Habits in your mind, causes that you've engaged in in the past, this is why you're having this great mysterious life right now. This is the mystery of life, cause and result. Is it boring or what? You know? It's just so boring you can hardly believe it. Isn't it true? It's just, who cares, right? So anyway, but according to the Buddhist teaching, that's what you need. That is the method you need to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and get yourself going. And just as it was possible for you to create such habit, it's also ha possible for you to change habit. It's in your hands. There's no mystery to that either. What is the method for changing habit? Stop. Here's a good method. Start something new. There's another good method. It's very simple. You can do it. The power is in your hand. You don't have to wait for someone to deliver it to you. If you want, I can dress up in something fancy and we can make a mountain out front. Would you like that? And then I'll tell you this big secret and you'll feel like, oh, wow, I've really got it now. You know, it's just to make you really get the feeling of it and you'll feel greatly empowered. But all of that is unnecessary and it's a big expense and I really hate to dress that way anyway, so could you just like think about it for a minute? Cause and effect are very simple. Very simple. Cause and result. When I was a teenager, I was on this campaign because I came up with this idea long before I ever heard of Buddhism. But I understood this somehow. I came up with this idea. I realized that our minds were like gardens and that it really mattered what you put in your garden as a seed. You know, I mean, if you put weed seeds in your garden, guess what you're going to come up with? If you threw tin cans and old boots in your garden, guess what it's going to look like? If you, excuse my French, but went to the bathroom in your garden, guess what it's going to smell like? And if you planted, on the other hand, fruits and flowers and beautiful things and really cultivated your garden beautifully, guess what it's going to be? It's going to be a place that you really want to be in. So I had this great idea. This was my great idea. I actually went through this period where I passed, plastered up these signs all over the place with drawings to remind me, the things that would key me off. Plastered up these signs all over the place with, that, with these simple words, plant your garden, plant your garden, plant your garden, plant your garden, plant your garden. I put it everywhere in my room, on the ceiling, so I lie back in bed, read the sign, plant your garden, you know? On my refrigerator, which it seems I visit a lot, um, bathroom, another place I go to frequently. All these places that I go to on a regular basis, I put these memos for myself, plant your garden, plant your garden, plant your garden. Or what seeds are you planting today? Stuff like that. It's this big memo thing that I did. Then my family and friends thought I was crazy. It was before that kind of thought was popular. I'm 42 years old. When I was a teenager, people weren't doing things like that. So my family thought I was a little odd. And uh, my mother kept pulling down the signs. <laughs> she thought I was trashing her house. So but my room was actually plastered with it. And, and so I, I think that that's really an effective thing to think about. You know, it's an effective way to live. And it really matters what you're thinking and what you're doing, what seeds you're planting now. And it's really important to do it double time, you know, not just in a passive way, but to aggressively go after it. Because you have to think that you have been existing since time out of mind. Isn't this true? You've had many, many lifetimes. You have a lot of weeds growing. You know, you have a lot in your garden that you don't even know is in there. When you look at your garden and you see the dirt of your garden, what you don't know is what's under there that hasn't come up yet. You should really think about that. That's important. You don't know what's going to hit you broadside. 
So you want to do this double time. You really want to be attentive to it and really think very hard about it. And of course, in our path, uh, that's why in Vajrayana we, we do these amazing practices like um, puja. We do pujas in which one uh, meditates on shunyata and then arises spontaneously as the, 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 as the deity, the bodhisattva or the Buddha, um, such as generating oneself as Guru Rinpoche or generating oneself as Amitabha. And the practice is mantra. And the mantra uh, is considered to be the pure display of the enlightened intention and enlightened awareness. So we work very hard at that with total concentration. Why do we do rather than why do we do that rather than just trying not to hate people anymore? Why do we do that? Because we know we've got to work double time. This is a very powerful antidote that works a million times stronger than just thinking good thoughts. And that antidote will purify what's under the ground as well that you aren't aware of. So we're purifying things at Mach 10 speed. Planting these amazing good seeds and digging up the old ones and tossing out the ones we don't want. And that's really what the extent of our practice is. That's really what the pr bottom line of our practice is. Why do we engage in generating ourselves as the deity? Why do we engage in generation and completion stage practice? Why do we work so hard? Why do we do so many pujas? Why do we meditate? Why are we always saying mantra? Why do we do this? So that the mind can be displayed in this rare form, displayed as, as, as the, the emanation or dance or movement of enlightened capacity, rather than letting ourselves simply continue in this continuum of cause and result. That's why we practice as we do. That's why we practice really weird things like devotional yoga. Devotional yoga is really weird in Western culture. We can't think that devotional yoga has any usage at all. We wonder why in the world do we do that? Well, because devotional yoga is an antidote to self-absorption. And self-absorption we've been practicing for such a long time, ever since we thought of the idea of self, which is, remember, inconceivable time ago, time out of mind. The assumption of self took place a long time ago, not at three years old, believe me. Psychologists are wrong about that. So devotional yoga is an antidote. One practices devotional yoga to one's guru, to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and in that way knows and learns to recognize one's own face in the sense that we think that the guru is our own face. We think that the Buddha is our own face and we see through practicing devotional yoga purify the cause of fixation on selfishness, purify the endless habit of self-absorption through the practice of devotion and then we can naturally see the true face of our nature. So it's an antidote. And everything we do on the path is like that. It's geared to do that. It is meant to produce that result. But it's very simple. It's not so exotic. It's something Americans can do, something Westerners can understand. You can understand cause and effect. If you study it, you can see it. It's a simple truth. It's attainable. It's in your hand. The best thing about understanding cause and effect is that once you understand it, you have the tool to change it automatically. Automatically. There's no mystery about it. There's no secret of life here. You can change it. It's in your hand. Yours. So that's the thing. And then, of course, as Buddhists, we also practice meditating on the primordial wisdom nature, meditating on shunyata, meditating on emptiness. So that's another antidote also to fixation on the continuum, which is all we are fixated on, the continuum, the experience of continuum, time passing, self moving through time. So the meditation on shunyata, the meditation on emptiness, is the antidote to that as well. Cause and result. It's ultimately all that. There is an end to suffering. That end to suffering is called enlightenment. That end to suffering is produced 
when we pacify the three root poisons, hatred, greed, and ignorance, and all those habitual tendencies that are born from those three root poisons, So that's the method. Big secret, right? Very simple. Simple enough for anyone. Nothing exotic about it. Nam, nam.